everyone for joining. Uh, I am Drew Ion. I'm the founder and chair of CDX. Uh, I see some familiar names. Some of you have been to our events. Uh, we're now moving into the realm of digital events and very excited about that. Um, and before I introduce Rita, uh, just a quick take on the poll here. It's 2% uh, in terms of uh, binge watching Tiger King. I'm not sure I believe that, all of you, but uh, that's okay. Um, and interesting, uh, maybe this is because we, we do attract a digital audience. Uh, I've always supported remote work at 65% here. Uh, in terms of your opinion of remote work changing. So that's pretty interesting and maybe not that surprising with our with our digital crowd and people probably being used to uh, uh, to work at home. But it is uh, my great pleasure uh, to introduce the, the very highly regarded Rita McGrath. Uh, Rita's done so many things. She's uh, a professor at Columbia Business School. She's she's written a couple great books. The most recent scene around corners, which is which is just great. Um, and she consults with with many companies, large and small, national and global, uh, in regards to management theory, innovation. Um, and we've had the great pleasure of having Rita speak at our events, and and she's just fantastic. And we look forward to bringing her back to our future events when we can all get together in person, Rita. But um, welcome and thank you again. And again, thank you everybody out there for joining. Uh, you know. Rita, maybe just a quick bit of background about yourself um, uh, beyond my intro there and, and, and who you are, and, and we'll jump right in. Sure. So uh, my, my professional work, uh, I'm a professor at Columbia Business School uh, in the city of New York, and I work really at the intersection of strategy and innovation. And so increasingly that has a digital layer connecting, connecting all those topics. And it's kind of interesting because if I go back to the beginning of my career, all the cool kids in strategy were sort of doing industry analysis. And it was all about things like R&D intensity and order of entry and first mover advantages. Um, and people didn't really think that much about innovation, really. Those of us studying innovation were sort of <laughs> huddled in a corner for warmth. You know, we were looking at inside the firm and how capabilities came to be. And I think what's happened in the intervening years is those two fields have really come together. And, you know, it is entirely possible to be a CEO even today and never to have touched innovation in your entire career. You know, you could be an operator for your whole life. And I think that's changing. I think today the demand really is on people to at least understand innovation and how it works and not be able to ignore it the, the way that they used to be able to do. That's great. And maybe just tell us just a bit about your latest book, Seeing Around Corners, and uh, and because I'd love to apply what you wrote there um, and to today and, and when we can sort of emerge from this, because I think it's Seeing around corners couldn't be more timely, right? As we're sort of all yeah, in a Once I got the timing right, right? I mean, my, my, one yeah. of my previous books was all about growth and it came out in 2009 and nobody wanted to talk about growth in 2009. Right. Um, so Seeing Around Corners is about strategic inflection points, which I define as some force, typically outside your organization, that creates a 10-time change in some parameter that underlies your business. Uh, and that could be a societal change. It could be a medical emergency, such as we're living through right now. It could be a technology change. Uh, but it's something that causes the taken for granted assumptions underlying your business operations to come into question. And so the book is really about how do you see them? Uh, once you've seen one, how do you decide what to do about it, which is kind of where we all are right now? And then how do you bring the organization with you as you navigate through these uh, inflection points? And I think one of the interesting ideas that came out of the book is that um, a lot of people don't see inflection points. And it's not that they're blind or that they're stupid, it's that they're so focused on the metrics that have underlined their business for many, many years, that when something comes along that just changes those metrics, it's very hard to grapple with that. I mean, for example, YouTube, right? Um, I mean, when YouTube first came out, nobody took it seriously. I mean, there was no CEO wandering around saying, oh my God, this is going to completely change the way media empires are run and advertising is right. commissioned. I mean, what was YouTube when it first came out? Cat videos, right? right. <laughs> you know? And yet, if you think about it, if you wanted to get a video message to hundreds of millions of people, you just you used to have to be Metro Goldwyn Mayer or the BBC or something. You used to have millions and millions of dollars of assets behind you. Today, literally two kids in a garage with a smartphone can produce a video that hundreds of millions of people can see and it costs nothing. And that kind of change is what I'm thinking of when I think of strategic inflection points. And we are clearly in one today. Um, and there's no playbook for this though, right? So in terms of the, the, the companies that you're talking to and even through what you've written over the years and in 
maybe going a little bit to management theory here, mm -hmm. um, how should how should executives be planning um, for the future, and or even just even dealing with this right now? There's no playbook, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you don't even know what resources you'll have when when we come out of this, you don't even know your staffing. Um, there's no playbook here. Um, is is there a framework that that you go back to that has sort of been tried and true to to manage through sort of the heart of this inflection point right now, and then we can kind of talk about what happens on the other side. Yeah. Well, so I think the biggest mistake is to do nothing um, because you're never going to learn if you just sit there in the fetal position in your office. You know. <laughs> so, um, so what I recommend is actually a very traditional technique. I've tended to apply it in innovation situations where, you know, you have a large amount of uncertainty relative to knowledge. And what we're finding now today is we're all in that situation where we have a huge amount of uncertainty relative to knowledge. And what you want to be doing is articulating the best assumptions you can come up with and then converting those assumptions to knowledge by running small experiments. So um, I think the mistake is to make, well, one mistake is to do nothing. Another mistake is to overreact and start doing big, huge leaps because we just don't know. So for example, in our world of education, um, we're seeing an awful lot of very creative experimentation around things like instructional technologies. And when we're all digital, what does that really mean? And how do we engage um, um, our students? Uh, and in whatever realm of endeavor that you are, I think we're gonna be seeing a lot of that experimentation. So the core principle here is plan, but plan to the limit of what you know, and then create some kind of experiment or test or something which is going to shed a little more light. So the more you can articulate your assumptions in terms of hypotheses, the faster you can right. learn. So just as an example, um, what will people pay for an online course? You know, I mean, that's a, a, in my world, that's a pretty important question. And will they pay for it the same way that they would pay for an in-person course? Now, we have a set of assumptions that we've had for years about people only being willing to pay, you know, the top dollar for something that's an in-person experience. And yet, if you think about it, an online experience doesn't involve travel. You can be much more democratic. You could have your whole team come, right, rather than just one or two people, uh, because you can't send the whole team away for a month, you know, to go take <laughs> take some education. Uh, and there are things that that digital technologies can do that are actually better than in person. So in a class, you know. I've got five loud mouths typically, and they occupy all the oxygen. Well, in a digital format, I can have much more control of the conversation and I can draw out the people who are quieter or maybe English isn't their first language or whatever. So, you know, I think we need to learn about what can these technologies do. And from that, we'll start to develop a clearer picture. But I think it's a mistake to try to overplan uh, beyond what the limits of your assumptions really are. In terms of as we start to look, you know, out at the other side, um, and this is, you know, whether you're watching CNBC and just the debates going on, what the consumer society looks like, obviously politicians and people who run institutions want to know what the, the landscape is going to look like and society will look like. Maybe you can talk a little bit about when we had a prep call for this, you talked about sort of, you know, the end of the second Gilded Age and, and maybe run through that sort of analogy of the first Gilded Age and what followed and then that you believe that we've had sort of this 40 year run in this sort of Gilded Age really since Reagan um, and that we are going to emerge on the other side with, uh, you know, a very different looking society and, and maybe even consumer society. But, but talk a, bit, a little bit about that because I found the analogy quite interesting. Oh, interesting. So the first Gilded Age, really, you can date it from about the 1850s to maybe 1910. Um, and that was really the big wave of industrialization that brought us you know, the robber barons, it brought us the first true global monopolies, uh, the gilded houses, you know, on Rhode Island, and, and this incredible income inequality where on one steamship, you know, you'd have the rich sort of having private butlers and dining rooms on and their, you know, cabins upstairs, and the poor literally herded into, you know, the phrase cattle class. Well, those steamships actually used to carry cattle as well as human beings. And the people that were very poor <laughs> sort of rode together with the animals. That was not like made up. That actually was cattle class. Um, right. And so that ended, um, well, it ended sort of in the 1910s. And what you started to see was, um, you know, labor creating more pressure on employers. You started to see some of the first great labor reforms. So things like the working week and you started to see unionization. And these were hard fought bloody battles. I mean, the, the entrenched owners of capital didn't want to yield an inch on anything. Uh, but eventually the force of, of, of public discontent, public unrest, um, you had populism in politics, much as you have here. Um, and so this ushered in, together with two world wars and a Great Depression, this ushered in a set of 
compacts that society created. And basically we all came together and said, we don't want people living in poverty. Um, we don't want our elderly unable to support themselves. We don't want um, you know, kids going hungry. We, we want the financial sector to make a decent return, but we want them hemmed in because unrivaled financial services tends to lead to economic crashes and instability. That, that, that's well researched, it's, it's well documented. Um, so there were a series of rules kind of put into place, um, I would say post-World War II, that you know guaranteed more of um, an even distribution of wealth between the very very wealthy and the rest of us. Um, taxation was fairly high. If you go back to the 1950s, the marginal tax rate was I think 91 percent. I mean, so every extra dollar that you made as an executive, you basically had to give up 90 cents of it. So honestly, your incentive to eke out every last dollar was much less because you know you were going to have to give most of it away anyway. Um, and 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 and. So, um, and, and this went on for uh, a, a couple of decades. It, it had the benefits of creating the middle class. It um, reduced income inequality substantially. And, you know, really that was kind of the golden age of American prosperity. And now beginning in the seventies, starting with, and I think it's an ideology, this maximizing shareholder value ideology, which was popularized by Milton Friedman and others um, started to pick away at that. So, and it didn't happen all at once, you know, but what you had was a loosening of the regulations on financial institutions. And you may remember the book, The Bonfire of the Vanities. In the 1980s, it was talking about corporate raiders. And in the book, literally one of them looks to the other and said, they're going to let us get away with this? Like, this isn't illegal what we're doing, which was basically taking a small share in a company, loading it up with debt, using that debt to kind of take it private and then and then basically just stripping the company of its assets. Um, and so what we've seen across the board is a diminution of the power of labor. We've seen massive offshoring. We've seen, um, you know, losing, uh, America losing its ability to uh, to produce, you know, necessary goods and services. You can't make a medical mask in this country. <laughs> you know, there's nobody manufacturing. Right. And nobody sort of thought at the moment those outsourcing decisions were made, well, well, hang on, maybe there are certain supplies we really ought to be able to make ourselves because let's say Vietnam right. decides, oh, we're keeping those. Thank you very much. Um, we've got um, a situation now where most of the jobs and the employment, despite a 10-year expansion, are horrible jobs. You know, they're minimum wage, there are people working two and three jobs just to make ends meet. Um, today, if you had kept the minimum wage where it was, say, in the 50s, um, an average minimum wage worker would be making $48 an hour. Um, so that just gives you a sense of we created an entire middle class and really this whole ideology of shareholder value. And the tragic thing about it to me is in the long run, if you're a long run investor, it actually has the effect of undercutting long run value creation. Because the creation of value, and this is what a lot of economists don't really focus on, the creation of value, and this goes all the way back to like Edith Penrose, consists of longtime employees who are familiar with the idiosyncratic resources of a firm, mobilizing those resources to capture new opportunity areas. And then they, as those areas start to mature, they put more resources in. And that really is the theory of corporate growth. And ironically, when you strip out all the slack and you strip out all the buffers, which is what we've done in a lot of industrial cases, um, what you have left is a firm that doesn't have the slack and the resources to go through that process. So ultimately, it starts feeding on itself and buybacks is just a symptom of this, right? Um, I mean, sure. we've become a buyback economy and ironically, right, right now is when we should be seeing buybacks because firms that believe in themselves should, should say, oh, we're undervalued, we should buy back our stock. Never the way it works, right? right? Firms do buybacks when times are good, which is completely opposed to the sort of theory of what buybacks are supposed to be for. Um, and I think we're going to start seeing, so, so that's a long-winded answer, but I think what we're going to start seeing now is, um, and you can see the early warnings already, labor is basically saying, hang on, you know, we're, you know, we're delivery people, we're grocery store clerks, we're working in pharmacies. Right. We're putting literally our lives on the line every single day by coming to work. We deserve right. more of a share in the prosperity that our labor creates. And I think you're starting to is, see more of that. Is, is like the thing with Amazon and Instacart workers striking, is that sort of a modern day version of this sort of response to the first Gilded Age ending? I mean, is, you know, is this what we're seeing now? I do, I do, absolutely. Well, if you think about it, um, there's been no um, uh, voice for labor in the sense of those kinds of workers. They're, they're not organized and the companies have been very uh, firm about not letting them organize. I mean, the, the, the guy that organized the Amazon strike got fired, you know, and of right. course for other reasons, but you know, 
it's a little bit of a coincidence if you ask me. Um, so yes, I think what we're starting to see is, um, and it's both on the part of the workers, but also on the part of the rest of us, you know, that, that are not in that position, who suddenly realize how vulnerable they are, how how much we need that kind of labor. And I think there's more of a sense of, of there's just something fundamentally unfair about the rate of inequality that we have right now. So the billionaires are all off hiding in their places in the Hamptons and the Amazon delivery guy is like, you know, putting, putting food on your table. I mean, there's just a, a, I think this crisis has the potential to really bring that to, in sharp relief to light. And my, yeah, and before, before we jump off the macro and into the more of the micro, um, you know, very interesting timing where we were the six or eight months ago in the business roundtable talking about, okay, it doesn't all have to be about shareholder value and all of our stakeholders. And, you know, a lot of people wondered whether that was lip service. Um, but will this crisis actually maybe, you know, you know, will that happen? You know, will we actually see that in practice with the modern day corporation on the other side of this? Well, a lot is going to depend on politics. Um, and, you know, obviously who wins in November will have a huge impact, but also local politics. I mean, you know, it would not take very much for um, a coalition in Congress to, for example, roll back this obscure 1982 SEC regulation that basically makes open market buybacks you know, get out of jail free. Um, before that, it was it was it was legally deemed to be illegal price manipulation on the part of stocks. I mean, all it would take would be a coalition of willing Congress people to basically repeal that ruling. Um, I mean, that that would be one very simple thing that could be done. Like that could be done tomorrow. Um, and then the CEOs are not going to be able to use stock buybacks to manipulate the stock. And, you know, it's an obscure thing. And the general public is not marching in the street with pitchforks about stock buybacks. It's a really dry, boring topic. But what it means right. for lay people is um, basically if your compensation is in stock and you can talk your board into doing a buyback, your stock goes up, you hit your compensation numbers. That means that's much more money you can extract from the corporation. So it basically right. overweights the role of investors and executives and underweights the value of even the rest of the um, uh, sure. In the economy. Yeah. And, and my last comment on the macro here, I saw Tom Friedman this morning and he was talking about how, you know, the, the Occupy Wall Streets of after the post financial crisis are going to seem like knitting parties, he said, compared to what's coming. I'd yes. be very interesting to see. So as much we as it's fun to float around it. Close on yes, that please, one second. I mean, we've yeah. never in history had 10 million people who were working on Friday and by Monday they're not. I mean, that's never happened right. in American history. Um, and I think that will right. produce really unprecedented reactions. Yeah, and just quickly, Rita, because I did have a comment from one of the viewers asking if you would repeat the law you referenced about stock buybacks. Sure, it's a 1982 uh, Securities and Exchange Commission ruling, and I think it's called um, 103B. It's like a really obscure um, um, thing. If you want to know more than you ever thought you needed to know about stock buybacks, the go-to guy to look up on this is a guy named William Lazonic. So L-A-Z-O-N-I-C-K. He's a uh, University of Am uh, Am Massachusetts at Amherst um, professor, and he's written extensively about this. Uh, probably a good place to start is his award-winning Harvard Business Review article, which is a couple of years old now. It's called Profits Without Prosperity, and he lays out the whole case that I'm just making in that piece. So that's where I would start. That's great. And um, I, ultimately, this is for you, everybody. So I encourage you to start um, forwarding some questions to Josh. And um, Josh, I think after we talk a little bit about innovation here, I'd love to go to, uh, to some questions in the audience. So um, right. you know, really, as we, as we come off the macro and, and down into the modern day a little bit here and, and more tactically, um, you know, this whole idea of innovation and right at CDX, we've been focusing on innovation, very specifically open innovation and open innovation centers and labs and corporate venture capital and you know, what's the future of innovation? You know, again, going back to this thing, I might have fewer resources. Are these labs and innovation centers and sort of innovation SWAT units, are they gonna get cut? Should I cut them if I'm managing? Um, talk, talk to me about the, you know, the future of innovation when we come, come out on the other side and, you know, where should the priority be for, for management uh, and executives and decision makers as it relates to their investment in innovation? It, you know, it seems like, is it, is it, let's just focus on survival first and now, and then we can get to our really cool innovation efforts, or should it be more fundamental and strategic to the company? Well, um, research and history show that often the strongest um, new ideas come out of these really resource constrained times. And there's some fascinating research that looks at failed ventures, and it turns out that the bootstrapped ventures, um, reason like number 10 that they failed is they ran out of money. 
funded ventures, ventures that people invest in, um, the number one reason they fail is they run out of money. And so any designer, any, any innovator will tell you being forced to work with the resources that you have actually makes you much more creative and resourceful. And if you're bootstrapping yourself, um, I forget who it was, but there was a well-known entrepreneur who um, was at an investor conference or something. And he said, oh yeah, we found a great source of resources. And everybody's like, oh yeah, what was this source of resources? He said, we got our customers to fund us. What? Yeah, yeah, they actually paid for what we produced. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. you know, I mean, to me, that's a mindset. So more seriously, um, a lot of that stuff you referred to, the, the, the centers and the accelerators and the cool places with the foosball, you know, things and the kombucha yeah. machine. Um, I mean, a lot of that's just innovation theater. You know, it's not producing real value, adding things that a customer will willingly pay for. Um, and, and I think a lot of that is just going to get cut because it wasn't really real, where I do think you're going to see innovation because companies can't not innovate right now. I mean, the idea that you would give up on your innovation efforts now is crazy because first of all, this is an, you know, this is an unfreezing. It's an unfreezing. Things are possible now. People will accept things now that even a month ago seemed completely incredible. It's amazing to me how fast people's share of mind has shifted. And so if you're not innovating and someone else is, that's going to be very bad news. But I think the innovations are going to be leaner, smarter, um, more targeted. Um, we're going to see a lot less of this big bang, you know, moonshot kind right. of innovation. And I think a lot more closer to the business innovation, I would say. Um, uh, and, and you'll see, I mean, what's interesting now is like, I used to talk about, well, you've got the core business and that's pretty predictable. And then you've got your options, which are very unpredictable. Everybody's core business is now an option. Um, all the assumptions are off the table. Nobody can count on anything. And so I think this fast learning, uh, figuring out what that business really looks like, the sort of smart pivots. Um, I mean, you're seeing right. companies now that used to manufacture, I heard a story about a company that used to manufacture shutters, like really high-end shutters, um, right. and realized that nobody's buying shutters right now, nobody's doing any of that. But what this entrepreneur was able to do was pivot his business into making um, uh, casings for people that need to be transported in hospitals safely, um, oh, and doubled his workflow, you know, within a month, it completely changed his manufacturing process, doubled his workforce, um, and he cannot keep up with demand. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, going to where the demand is and being a little creative about where else your capabilities can get traction, I think is something we all need to start really thinking about. And I think that's innovation. That's great. Yeah, I, I do want to start to, to ask a question a little later about kind of organizational design and the future of organizational design. But Josh, I'm sure we have some some good questions out there and we'd love to to get out to the audience here. Yeah, let's do that in a second. I do want to just launch one quick poll because to, to read it to your okay. point about innovation strategies that companies are having and digital transformation. Just want to launch a quick poll to see, you know, just get a, a really, you know, a temperature check on everyone who's on the call to think, you know, does this really impact, you know, will it have an impact on their speed of, of digital transformation? Uh, you know, will it make you move faster? Where people did, were already set on a, on a path that they don't think it's going to change. Um, and, uh, and while I'm, uh, while I'm doing that, I'm going to pull in our first question. Uh, give me one second. We're going to bring up uh, Cheryl in a second. Uh, Cheryl, I'm, um, unmuting you and I'm turning on your your video as well so if you'd like to uh power uh, here Josh yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, welcome Cheryl that's that's welcome good. Cheryl if you can if you can introduce yourself and then uh, ask your question of Rita thank you hi I'm I'm Cheryl Root I'm a director and professor with Carnegie Mellon and I teach um well I run a master's in technology ventures and the technology ventures are structured to create new ideas, but make them executable. So um, I also teach business models and strategy. And I was very lucky long time ago to be able to <laughs> get immersed in your discovery driven planning, which I have used. I teach my students regularly. So I have always valued that. <laughs> you and another <laughs> lady uh, were a very influence, big influence for structures. As you talk about innovation and operation, um, it's, it's a yin-yang. You can't just have innovation tucked away in a research lab, uh, which is just proven not to work. I worked for Hewlett Packard for a long time. Um, and so the structures, I think, are changing. The hierarchies are disappearing. 
And I think we're doing more about creating communities around problem solving and new ideas and how you can quickly shift to those ideas witnessed by the increased number of uh, entrepreneurs. So my, my question is about how do you see the structures changing and what's the impact of the high volume of entrepreneurial efforts and, and whether they're acquired or turn into a business? What's the difference where one can turn into a business and become huge and others are needing to be targeted being acquired? So a um, couple of interesting things to unpack there. Um, I think the first observation I would make is that as this kind of communication becomes more widespread, it's going to be a lot easier to reach across the organizational silos than it ever has been and much easier to create communities that go horizontally. At a kind of a CEO level, um, what I'm hopeful for is I think that gives them the chance to see much more at what I call the edges of the organization. So out there where you know, actual customer interactions are happening and so forth. Um, with respect to how entrepreneurs build their companies to either scale or sell, um, yeah. you know, to me, I think, I think as, it's, as a founder, I think you're always better off building your company as though it was a long-term proposition. I mean, not everybody believes that, but I think you build a healthier company that way. And as a potential acquirer, I, I think, you know, when you acquire something that was built to be acquired, um, you know, there's a good reason to do that. If you've got a great idea, something like a Dollar Shave Club, right? You've got a great idea, you've got great capital, but you can't afford armies of lawyers to defend yourself against Procter & Gamble. So at that point, maybe it does make sense to be acquired by Unilever, which is what happened. So Unilever's lawyers can face off against P&G's lawyers and, and you can get on with your business. So in that sense, I think that's a healthy kind of acquisition. Um, the ones that were really just built to look good you know, and they're just kind of thinking their way through, how do I get through my D round? And then hopefully some corporate giant will embrace me. Um, I, I think those are typically not great businesses because they haven't had to sort of prove themselves. They're often fun, overfunded and they're funded for, you know, the wrong reasons. Um, so I think, I think there's a bit of a value judgment you have to make about how viable would the business be if it was a standalone business. If it's something that you need the big company to scale or you need the brand or you need the lawyers or, you know, there's some asset or resource you just can't get as a small company, then I think it kind of makes sense. Taking the other view, for a larger firm, my research suggests that the kinds of acquisitions you want to make are the fill in the gap um, capability acquisitions. So if you look at a company like Cognizant, for example, um, they've had a string of acquisitions they've made over many, many years, but they don't tend to be these big mergers of equals acquisition. They tend to be capability filling in the blanks kind of acquisitions. And I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, sometimes it's not, you don't have the time or it's not worth it to build everything yourself, you know, so sometimes it makes sense to go outside the boundaries of your organization to bring in some fresh talent and ideas. That doesn't mean they're going to stay with you forever. And I think that's something important to remember too. Genuine like startup people are not usually happy living under a corporate umbrella. So, you know, a great example of this is the guys that went on to found uh, Flatiron Health. Um, and I've written about them in my book, and, and there's an article about them on Medium. Just amazing young entrepreneurs came from the Wharton School, uh, where I did my PhD, um, started this company that they sold to Google for like $94 million at the age of like 22. <laughs> and they had to go work for Google, right? And so they basically spent two years hanging around, not doing very much because Google had kind of taken their technology and was absorbing it into its large engine. And so they spent the two years thinking about what their next business was going to be. And when their non-competes ran out, they went out and founded Flatiron Health. And that's now, that was a $3 billion acquisition by Roche. Um, and again, that's a case where they want to really make a dent in the way that we treat oncology, especially childhood oncology. And having a, a corporate parent like Roche gives them that scope to be able to have a much bigger impact than they could have had if they just kept it as a standalone firm. But it was a healthy, profitable firm before it was acquired. Right. right. Now, Matt Rogers did something similar relative to Nest, doing iPhone and then getting frustrated being under the thumb and then said, okay, I'm gonna go do Nest. And he and his buddy did that. <laughs> Five years later, sold it for three billion. You know, right. it, but right. but he, like you say, was structuring it to be um, innovative and mm -hmm. lots of uh, capabilities to fill in a gap. Mm -hmm. and, and being able to discover those gaps is where I think your idea of uh, looking at uh, assumptions and uncertainties and working backwards from that. Mm -hmm. So, what would it be like out there? And then how do I have to consider it without carrying all the baggage that I have today? And I think our change in our world right now has eliminated a whole lot of baggage carrying. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, this platform, Zoom,
it's the guy that started Zoom as a spinoff from Cisco. <laughs> Mark Laurie, who now is running um, Walmart's digital arm, uh, was, was his com original company was diapers.com and that got acquired by Amazon. And he spent two years at war with Jeff Bezos in that platform <laughs> you know, before finally saying, I've had it with this. And he went off and he founded jet.com. Um, and then, you know, that now has been acquired by Walmart and he's running all of Walmart's digital capability. Right, great. I think we have a bunch of questions. I'm going to go next to uh, to Stephen Rowe. Stephen, I sent you a request to start your video. There you are. Hi. Hi. How's it going? Good. Hey, Stephen. Good. Let me know if you can't understand my accent. It's a little thick. Uh, I, I'm, I'm from Glasgow in Scotland. And uh, so if you're struggling to understand or I'm speaking too fast, please uh, let me know. Uh, thanks for hosting this. The, the, thanks for joining us. No worries. Th thanks for hosting the meeting and uh, some of the information available already has been uh, fantastic. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm a micro company. I run a micro company and uh, I rely on lots of freelancers and uh, casual staff coming in. Uh, my background is uh, my little company is a spin out from a university in Glasgow and I've been running some digital transformation projects uh, for the last 18 months. But I think I'm now only starting to realize that the difficulty I'm having going into other organizations is that I don't have a, a toolkit for innovation that I can take with me. You know, we, we, companies want to transform digitally. The appetite is there at the start of these projects, but we quickly become bogged down in uh, silos within organizations, but also I think, you know, it's done at an arm's length and it's quite hard to communicate what's happening in real time back up the chain. So uh, I'm just starting on my journey to understand how to better uh, approach innovation and to report it back to the companies that I'm working with. And I'm just wondering what you think the essential toolkit is to, you know, if you were going to recommend a toolkit for that style of work. I, absolutely. Um, so I have a colleague, Ryan McManus, and we are also kind of a micro enterprise, but um, so we were looking for a toolkit. And what we found is there's a mountain of stuff that will help you with the idea management part of innovation. So uh, I, uh, you know, there's, there's a thousand of those. Um, and, and they help you find ideas and group ideas and sort ideas and blah, blah, blah. On the other side of the thing, when it comes to commercialization, there's a mountain of software that will help you with project management where we've struggled and where we have not been able to find anything is that piece in the middle, which is I've got, you know, a prototype or I've got a working thing that I'm trying to do something with. And I now need to use a discovery driven approach to milestone by milestone, figure out how it works. Yep. I've got to be able to report to management what the status is in an easy way, not digging through spreadsheets and PowerPoints and blah, blah, blah. And I've got to be able to manage it dynamically, right? And um, it would be really great to know if somebody in Auckland had the same idea as somebody in Glasgow so I could connect yep. So we're actually, and I didn't want to do this, but we're actually building software to do that. Um, and, you know, Drew and, and Josh, maybe this is a subject for another call. For those that are interested, I'd be very happy to organize a demo for you. Um, it's a software as a service platform. It's got all the industrial grade stuff it needs to have. And right now it has three modules. Um, the first module is just capture the ideas. So you know, it could be four words or it could be a whole kind of business plan. It can accommodate either. It's pretty text heavy. The second module really does take discovery driven planning. And what that module does is it says there's roughly 20 major assumptions uh, that any business has to figure out. And so we, we allow you to document what the assumption is, document what you did with, the, with that, document how much you spent, and then how much your cumulative spend is on, on working on a project. Um, now this does a couple of really cool things. So let's say you got an innovation and it's been budgeted at $2 million and you discover after your $15,000 and three checkpoints in that it's just not a great idea. Well, theoretically what you can do is stop, right? And you can say, okay, corporation, I've just saved you $2 million less the 15,000 it took us to find out this direction wasn't going forward. Totally transparent. Anybody can pop in and look. And for your CFO, right? They, they can get off your back because they can see exactly what you're doing and spending. And it just eliminates all that back and forth. So that's the second module. 
The third module is a portfolio management module. And what that does is it allows you to take for every project, you can plot it against two vectors of uncertainty. We call them market and technology. And you can, at a glance, see where all the stuff in your portfolio is. And then we overlay that. I mean, these are only tools, right? So you overlay that with a capability building process, which says, hey, if you're going to say something's really certain, I want to see your evidence, right? I want to see the order from a customer. I want to see the technical test that showed this was okay. So what you can start to impose now is an appropriate discipline on the organization that's very consistent with what you need to do to manage under uncertainty. So we're, you know, we were going to be going through a big launch process now, and we're kind of calibrating what that might be. But I actually think you know, another application of this might be to look at, and this is back to your question earlier, Drew, what am I doing, right? And what can I kind of clean out that really isn't going to be as fast or as essential or as meaningful for the future? And I think you can use the same exact toolkit to do that. Um, just It's just on the other side. It's asking the question, what should my... Along those, like? Yeah, along those lines, Rita, and we'll, we'll get to the results of the poll in just a second, but I have a follow-on question on that specifically. We had talked a lot about sort of accelerating digital transformation <laughs> efforts, and that seems like the obvious thing that is happening now will happen, should happen. My question, though, is, is, again, coming back to this prioritization of resources, we want to accelerate digital transformation, but the corporation, the larger ones, even smaller, mid-sized ones, may have fewer resources, or they may just be nervous about spending lots of money, right? Everyone's going to, I think, evolve out of this in a very, in a very conservative sort of posture um, as it relates to investment resources and finances. So do you believe that there is, you know, it's, that there is going to be this acceleration of digital transformation? And if so... How, how should companies prioritize the resources to make that happen? If, if, they, if they really weren't doing a good enough job before and they really feel they need to accelerate now for how things look in, in sort of the post-crisis world, but I'm more conservative with my resources, how, how do I square those? Well, it comes down, I think, to your judgment about what your competition's doing. So if you've got an out-of-date business model that's consuming lots of resources, you're slow to respond to your customers, you're not able to sense and respond to your environment, you're not agile, and you want to continue doing that because you're not willing to make the change or invest in making the new things happen, and your competitors are making those changes, um, you know, customers don't really care about you, by the, by, by the way, <laughs> you know, no customer wakes up in the morning and says, yes, great, today I signed my statement of work for whatever. Um, what they want is the end result. And so, you know, a customer is going to go to that provider that is responsive and friendly and whatever. The other thing I would say, though, is I think I want to separate out the idea that this digital transformation stuff takes huge amounts of resources from the just of genuine resistance to change. What we've found with a number of, and these are smaller scale projects, but what we've found is if you can get them fast at scale in kind of an agile way, they can actually start delivering returns like from the minute you flip the switch. So I would stay away from the big giant, you know, let's, re let's redo all the plumbing overnight kind of projects. I would instead work on much more sort of focused projects. So let me give an illustration because I think that brings it to life. So um, one of the cases I talk about in my book is a German metals manufacturer. I know. Be still, you're beating heart. They're super exciting. And they're in like the wrong part of the metals business. So the people making money in the steel business, for example, you got the big manufacturers like the ArcelorMittals and they produce raw steel. And then you got consumers of steel. So these are people that build buildings and make plumbing and whatnot. Um, and in the middle, you've got these thousands and thousands of these metals distributors. Uh, well, Gisbert Rold, the CEO of um, um, Klockner, back in 20, probably about 2013, 2012, 2013, had a look at this messy supply chain. And what he realized was people were literally faxing orders in. I mean, they and, and it would be picked up by a manual process and somebody would go out to the warehouse and, and say, yeah, do we have flanges today? You know, that kind of thing. I mean, it was just uh, multiple supply, just horrible, horrible supply chain conditions. And he kind of looked around and he said, hang on, there's, there are these things called digital platforms. And if we don't figure this supply chain mess out, somebody like an Amazon uh, will. And so if we don't digitize, somebody's going to do it to us. So we should start to digitize. So they first began their effort with a professor sort of moderating sessions with the senior executives in Duisburg, which was their headquarters. And as you probably can anticipate, that went absolutely nowhere. So what Rule did next was he took two engineers, just two, sent them to Berlin, and they kind of embedded themselves in the entrepreneurial hotspots in Berlin. And he said, look, 
I, you know, I don't care what it is, do something that makes us easier for our customers to do business with that's digital. I don't care what it is, you figure it out. And so the very first thing they did was they created a system which did nothing more than automate the fax process. So instead of sending a fax, you could place your order on your phone or computer. That was all it did. Now, what's interesting about that is it's a digital thing, better for customers, not very expensive, two guys in Berlin for six months. On the intake side, on the Klockner side, it was exactly the same as getting a fax. So they didn't mess around with the internal operations of the company, right? So from the inside the company perspective, it really wasn't any different. So it didn't provoke this sort of immune response. Thing. So that was step one. Step two. Okay, now that we've got uh, orders coming in, wouldn't it make sense if we took our, our inventory catalog and made that digital? Now, again, not a huge change, right? They had been keeping these things on spreadsheets and so forth anyway. So all we're doing now is we're making a platform under them. We're taking the exact same product numbers, the exact same commodity codes, and, 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 and. So here we are now three years later, and Klockner's now achieved two unbelievable accomplishments. One is that they've uh, created a platform for all their customers to do business with them. And here's what's super cool. Back in the day when it was all faxes and stuff, um, the only products they could sell were metals products, right? But if I'm building a building, right, guess what? I also need light bulbs and I need sheetrock and I need drywall. And so their customers started to come to them and say, you know, you're so easy to do business with. Could you sell us this other stuff? And so what Klockner then did was they created supply contracts with suppliers of those kinds of materials. And for those suppliers, again, easy. It's just another order. I just delivered a Klockner instead of delivering to the end customer. That's fine. And so now with this platform, they've actually been able to expand their footprint. Meanwhile, with the support of the German government, they've created a thing called ZOM, which is X-O-M, and it's a digital platform for the whole industry. And Klockner's a participant and a sort of lead actor, but not the primary actor. So here's the kind of principles I would think about when you think about accelerating digital transformation. Start with something that everybody can agree is really broken, don't mess around with, with the core processes yeah. first. Leave that for later. Digitize what you can as quickly and effectively. Show some early success. Get people comfortable. Oh, the other thing that Klockner did, which I thought was really super admirable, was they didn't sort of say, oh, those guys in Duisburg, you know, they're dinosaurs. They're done. And, oh, you know, sparkly people in Berlin, you're all we care about. No, he said, look, right. if we commoditize, which is essentially what they're doing, if we commoditize the kind of cost plus business, right? And the cost becomes whatever the market will bear. We can't make our money on products anymore. So we need to right. be able to make our money on advanced services. And for advanced services, I need those technical experts. I need those guys with like steel in their bones who understand everything about metal and how it works and what they can do. And so they're evolving service offerings now. So they have, for example, one of the world's leading, um, um, uh, Called leading edge uh, laser cutting technologies for for actually cutting steel in ways that simply cannot be done by a human being, and so if right. you're a customer who needs something like that, you're gonna you're gonna pay mar decent margins right. to get that yeah. particular thing, you know that you couldn't get before and you can't get from anybody else. So that and, to me is like yeah. a path for a digital transformation. And there's the the whole results there. Um, Yes, we'll move faster. Um, and and to, to sort of my anecdotal share um, with what you just said, Rita, um, is, is we have a great relationship with Phil Easter, who's the head of emerging technology at American Airlines. And he started a hack, an internal hackathon at America. And when he talked about digital transformation and he talks about you know, what he focuses on in innovation, it started about five or six years ago. I've had the pleasure of judging out there. It started with like six teams and 60 coders. And last year I walked into a huge ballroom of 102 teams and 1,100 coders, all American Airlines lines employees and the vast majority of the things that they're coding and that we were judging were solving internal business problems operational problems of american airlines yeah there were maybe a third of them were kind of consumer facing like apps and things like that and how can we improve the mobile app experience for our customers but he says look now we've taken so many ideas from these hackathons um, that have solved internal sort of business or operational problems and you know and one of the winning sort of apps was how can they better monetize through sort of a direct app based sort of ordering system or placement system monetize their cargo. It was really interesting, right? And that ended up being like, they ended up monetizing that. So to your point, it can be something that's internal where everybody agrees, sure, we can, you know, doing something on the consumer facing app, it might take several people to get that approved. And how do we do that? And it's like, you know, you risk sort of going out there to the customer and how are they going to respond to it? But everybody says, sure, can we monetize our cargo better? Absolutely. Let's go for it. And, and even think about hackathons, folks. I mean, and one thing that when Phil originally said, we're going to do hackathons, and he said, yeah, it's only going to be our own employees who come 
admin and code. Um, and, you know, opening it up to the outside and hackathons is something that people have always done. And I think there's a place for that. Um, but think about just doing a hackathon internally um, and solving your own problems internally, I think is interesting. Um, so we saw the poll results. Josh, I'd still love to get out for another question or two here before we wrap. We have one uh, right here. We have uh, Panushka, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, you have a question for Rita? Yes. Um, hi, so I'm Pranusha. I work at Copperfield Advisory. We are a marketing comms and strategy consulting firm. Um, and we're also part of the same holding company as Economy Clarum. Um, firstly, thank you. This has been really interesting. Um, it's a great break from a work day, but also related to work. Um, so my question is um, that inflection points are obviously um, difficult to identify before they actually happen. Um, at the start of the session, when you mentioned that the impact is essentially like a 10 times change, that sort of helps quantify it. Um, but I'm just curious to hear how that came about. How that idea came about? Yeah, like what, oh, how the 10 times came about? Like, was yeah, there any? Uh, sure, that was actually um, an idea that was created by Andy Grove, who wrote a fabulous book back in the 90s called Only the Paranoid Survive. Uh, and he talks about the 10 time change. Um, a fabulous book. But um, looking at his book, he, his, and his book, by the way, for all of you, go get it. Um, it's a fabulous sort of guide to getting through an inflection point, that, which is what that book's really about. It's about the inflection point is upon us. Now we got to figure out what to do. And the shorthand answer is you need to diverge lots of, and that's what I was talking about, fast learning, you know, lots of ideas, lots of input, test lots of assumptions. Then as things become more clear, now you double down on what you think the right path is going to be, but we're not there yet. So the motivation for my book was I said, well, okay, that's when you're in the midst of an inflection point. What could you look at before that moment that might give you some early warnings that an inflection point could be brewing? And even this particular one, um, you know, Bill Gates gave a very famous TED talk in 2015 uh, talking about the need for pandemic um, preparedness. And, and he's been joined by many, many other experts. And, you know, unfortunately, human beings are always prepared to, you know, invest and lose money when the crisis is upon us. And, you know, the problem, as a, as a public health friend of mine was saying, she said, you know, we in public health, when we do our jobs right, everybody thinks we totally overreacted and that it was a waste of money because nothing happened. And that's one of the tricky things about these leading indicators, right? Because the goodness of a leading indicator is not, did what we predicted happen? It's, did we prevent a catastrophe in time? Or did we prevent something negative from happening in time? And a great example of this is the Y2K thing, right? Um, you know, when the big moment came, the year 2000 came, what happened? Nothing happened. Why did nothing happen? We built the entire Indian outsourcing industry. We, we invested billions in Y2K compliance. Um, and so I think the, the, the kind of early warnings and the 10 times effect is, is the, the sort of nexus of reasons I think that's such an inflection point right now. Great. Thanks, Pranusha. Rita, you know, as, as we, we're going to have to wrap up here fairly soon, and I know this is a difficult question to answer because no one really has the answer, but just in terms of your, through your experience and, you know, as we get to the other side, and I suppose we're sort of going to be in this, you know, recovery in a pre-vaccine world and then recovery in a post-vaccine world, I suppose. But what, for going back to the consumer a little bit, mm -hmm. what do you think fundamentally will change about the consumer and consumer society through this crisis, whether it's as we get to the other side of this particular time and or long, even longer term and what longer term trends might hold. But I'm sure you've thought a lot about this and talked with a lot of executives about it. And maybe no one knows the answer for sure, but I'm, I'm curious what you're thinking about and what's the, what's the, the post-crisis consumer society look like and what big fundamental changes or even one uh, that you think sure. is going to So the first thing that I think we all need to think about is that right now and involuntarily, all of our spending is up for grabs. So a lot of those routine things that we never really thought about, now everybody's thinking about them. And so when you have a, a break in routine like that, a lot of habitual consumption behavior, I think is up for grabs. And that could be bad if you're somebody who makes their money by people just every month, you know, the payment goes out to your cable company, for example. Um, and I think one of the first things that people who sell to consumers need to be really thinking about is, if I look at that consumer um, spending, right, um, how is that likely to shift as people reevaluate every dollar, every yen, every euro that they spend, because that is what's going to happen for an awful lot of people. 
for people that aren't even in financial distress, it still produced a, a stoppage, a shock, you know? And so now I could, I could see people looking at each other and going, do we really need to eat out four times a week? Or, you know, I've learned to make fantastic paella. This is great. You know, so we've, we're learning a whole bunch of new habits. And one of the most interesting things about this crisis to me is if you had asked us to make those investments or make those changes prior to the need to, none of us would have said yes. Now we're forced to. So we're forced to learn to cook. We're forced to learn to do these things. We're forced to learn things like Zoom. Um, now we're making those investments. And when we get to the other side of this, it's not like those investments are going to go away. So the last thing I leave your listeners with is progress on any technological change is path dependent. So something that happens early in the evolution of an inflection point has a disproportionate effect on what happens next. So a tangible example of this is the QWERTY keyboard, right? QWERTY keyboards were originally designed to slow typists down, and yet that is one of the most enduring artifacts of modern life because it happened early in the evolution of typewriters and then word processors and then computers and da 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 da, da and nobody's willing to relearn touch typing once you've learned it. Uh, we're going to see that effect across our whole economy.